You can go ahead, Dr. Carr. Okay. Ready? One sec, one sec. We'll we'll introduce you in a few seconds. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Men Newsweek Conference, where our goal is to bring you the most cutting edge information from medicine's global leaders. I am Paloma Paloma, and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I want to first acknowledge the great team that helps to make these events a reality. Our founders are two internationally recognized researchers, Drs. Jan Leisman and Chandler Park, who is also the president of Kentucky ASCO. Our chairs include Drs. Park and Leifman. Our associate directors include Madhuri Balasubradi, Muskan Joshi, and Gayathri Menon. Our associate managers include Alexandra Van de Kieft, William Wilkerson, Balavi Pai, and Ahmed Aziz. Our educational committee includes Sean Jakowicz, Shuba Pawar, Choria Harshal, Reda Khan, Sri Valapeni, Sumya Nadar, Rabab Hunaid, Ahmad Bin Zayi, and me, Helena Kaloma. We also want to thank our partners, Vumedi, Global Leader in Medical Video ed Educational Content, and the National Society of High School Scholars, an honor society founded by Class Nobel of the Nobel Prize family. The moderator for today's event is Sumia Nadar. Now, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jeff Karp. Dr. Karp is an internationally recognized leader and scientist in anesthesiology, perioperative, and pain medicine. He's a global authority in the fields of drug delivery, medical devices, stem cell therapeutics, and tissue adhesives. He's been recognized as one of 11 Boston doctors making medical breakthroughs by Boston Magazine, by MIT's Technology Review Magazine, as one of the top innovators in the world, and by Popular Mechanic as one of the top 20 new biotech breakthroughs that will change medicine. Dr. Karps currently serves as Professor of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He is also a principal faculty member at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and an affiliate faculty member at the Broad Institute and at the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. He is a mentor, speaker, and author 
including of a recently published book, Using Nature's Playbook to Spark Energy, Ideas, and Action In. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Karp. The floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak here and for that nice um, introduction. So before I get going, I have an institutional responsibility to declare my conflicts of interest, um, for which I have many. Um, I have co-founded several companies um, that have spun out of my lab, and I'm an active consultant um, in, um, in all of them um, and hold equity. And today I thought maybe I would share with you uh, some of the stories. So before I get going, um, I wanted to first just start off with showing uh, deep appreciation uh, for current and previous lab members. Um, I feel very blessed and, and grateful to have such wonderful people um, to work with. Um, and um, we've had people from over 30 countries uh, in the lab um, and it's highly, highly multidisciplinary. Um, covering fields of engineering, all kinds of different engineering, um, biology, immunology. Um, we've had a cardiac surgeon, a gastrointestinal surgeon, a dentist, um, and it's just highly dynamic and, and always changing. Um, and uh, I really like to try to focus on creating a lateral environment um, where everyone can learn from each other um, and, uh, and really an environment where uh, actually try to minimize the overlap in expertise um, so that uh, everybody can bring something um, unique to the table. And I think this really just creates a, a great environment. And, and um, I just wanna say thank you to, uh, to all the people in this picture as well as the, uh, the previous lab members. And so I thought maybe what I would do is start from um, kind of reverse back in time to when I was a, a PhD student in um, Toronto. Um, and I was just really getting fired up about research. I had done some research um, when I was at McGill in my undergrad for a few summers. Um, and that kind of got me hooked. And, uh, and then I quickly realized during my PhD that that wasn't gonna be enough and that I needed to keep going. Um, and um, I had been following the work of, of Bob Langer at, at MIT um, for many years and just really excited about all the things coming out of his lab, as well as um, what, what previous people in his lab were and, and current people were, were saying about him as a mentor. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to go for the gusto here. I'm going to send him an email. Um, who knows whether he'll read it, but I'll just assume that he will. Um, and so I took like several weeks to compose this email um, that, uh, and this was in 2003 about, um, and uh, the subject line was a postdoc candidate with big ideas, um, with big in, in caps. And I kind of described to him how um, there were a couple ideas I had and, you know, how I would potentially go about, um, you know, solving uh, certain medical problems and, you know, it's just, it was kind of half baked. I just <laughs> did the best I could with, with those few weeks. Um, and so uh, he responded immediately as he's known uh, to do. And he said, you know, basically that, um, you know, he, he thought that uh, my experience was interesting, um, but he didn't have any funding um, to accept me in the lab. So um, I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, maybe he's just saying that and, you know, he just kind of wants me to go away. Um, but maybe I should just, you know, be optimistic and think like, OK, well, maybe if I could get my own funding, maybe he would take me. So I wrote back to him right away and I said, well, if you give me if, if I come with my own funding, would you accept me in the lab? And he immediately responded with yes. Um, and then at the time, um, there was this, I'm Canadian, and there's the National um, Engineering, uh, Science Engineering Research Council uh, provides fellowships uh, to postdocs, um, and you don't actually have to come back to Canada at the end of it. It was two years of, of funding. So I said to him, so immediately after he said that he would accept me if I got funding, I said, would you um, put that in writing? And so he immediately responded, 
Sure. So he put it in writing and I applied for this fellowship. This was back in the days when there were no, um, it, it wasn't digital. It was like, actually you print everything out. So I just, there was no space for um, such a letter of support, but I just tacked it on to the end saying, if you give this fellowship to Jeff, then he'll get a position in, in Bob's lab. And uh, I waited a few painful months. And then finally I got the fellowship and I wrote back to Bob and that's how I got into, uh, into his lab. Uh, and this is a, a picture of us um, with a technology that we had um, developed, um, an adhesive technology through mimicking how geckos can walk up walls and hang from a single toe. Uh, and we were attempting to create a surgical tape um, that could do the same, that was elastic um, and biodegradable. So when I was in Bob's lab, I learned a ton of things. Um, he was just an incredible mentor and there were just people from all over the world working on everything you possibly could imagine. Um, and um, as I was advancing through my research career, I quickly realized that, um, you know, I was really excited to publish work, but what was really driving me was how to bring science um, or scientific breakthroughs to patients? Um, and really, how could one accelerate that, that process? Um, and so that's where I sort of cultivated this um, desire and um, passion um, for accelerated um, medical problem solving. And I think, um, you know, we all need examples um, around us, you know, in our environments of, of what's possible. Um, we all need to have uh, role models and, and Bob was an incredible role model. Um, and, you know, I had some really incredible mentors as well for my, my PhD and even in before them, uh, before then. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, this really helped me to kind of create a North Star of what I really wanted to do. And that was sort of seeing Bob and other people in the lab be able to take um, science and turn it into, you know, products that could, that could help patients. And, um, and so I kind of realized um, along the way, and this is something that, uh, you know, I ha had a lot of challenges growing up um, in school, um, uh, with various learning difficulties. Um, you know, I was, I was identified as having a learning disability actually, um, early on and ADHD. And, and I kind of had to develop, um, a lot of processes to cope, um, uh, with the struggles that I was, um, kind of encountering in school. And so when I sort of, sort of realized this is what I want to do and commit to, um, this process of, uh, you know, the uh, sort of creating medical um, products that could then, you know, using science to then, you know, help patients, essentially, I realized I, that I didn't have um, a process for doing this, that I had been in Bob's lab, and I had seen a lot of people do it. But when I started to kind of try to do it, I realized I didn't um, really know what to do. So it's kind of one thing to see other people do it, and it's another to do it yourself. So I realized I needed a process. And, um, and so what I did was I said, okay, well, how am I going to develop this process? I have no business training. Um, and in fact, you know, no formal training whatsoever in, in kind of commercialization of science. Um, and so what I did was I sort of made this strategic decision that early on, you know, my faculty position was very busy writing grants and, and, you know, which was actually quite difficult. I wrote over a hundred grants in my first two, two and a half years. Most of them were rejected. Um, and, uh, but I decided to commit to meeting people in the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and a, um, and I think, you know, this is really, and, and I forged like a lot of um, not just kind of having a network, but actually relationships, because I think in academia, because we're not trained really in how to impact the world, um, you know, we need a process to do that. And so what I did was every two or three weeks for probably about 10 years, I would meet with people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and um, just try to develop relationships. So the goal was um, you know, just to identify synergies with people. Um, and this really helped me to crystallize my goal of um, not just publishing papers, but trying to find a way to bring those approaches um, forward. 
So just to give you a sense of what that really looked like, um, I would meet with patent lawyers, um, investors, reimbursement experts, CEOs, manufacturing experts, regulatory experts, um, biotech, med tech, consumer health experts, just people in the community, um, you know, going for lunch with them or coffee or just, you know, inviting them to the lab for a tour. Um, I would go to all kinds of different networking events and just really try to introduce myself, even though many times I didn't feel like going, I didn't feel like speaking and, you know, but I felt I just like, you know, knowing that, you know, I had kind of found this, this um, intention, this sort of passion, this purpose. Um, and I tried to really let that lead. Um, and so I would go to these events and be like, okay, I just have to meet like two new people. Um, and I would, I would um, just gradually, I was able to connect with people. And so what this did is this actually created a filter um, for almost like a translational filter for the projects in the lab, because now as we advance projects, um, I reach out to people in the community and I ask, you know, do you think this could be manufactured? What do you think the IP space is here? Is this something investors are looking at? Um, is this something that, you know, pharma or med tech would be interested in? Um, what's the best first application, which actually is a really hard, you know, when you develop a platform, like a material that could be used in all kinds of different things, it's hard to figure out what's the best first application to apply it. So um, kind of through these relationships, I was able to kind of hone in on um, how to make decisions about moving the science forward to maximize potential that that this, um, if things went well, that we would be able to, um, you know, to bring this to, uh, to patients. And so what I wanted to do is also, you know, I spent a lot of time in self-reflection thinking about um, the medical problem solving process. And I just wanted to share with you, I tried to condense this down into a single slide of how we go about um, solving pro problems, um, and uh, and and then trying to create you know um, translational opportunities to bring those into startup companies. Um, so I've co-founded many companies as you saw before, and this is I think kind of uh, um, not all of it, but a lot of the core sort of element or or process that um, that that I've been using and it's constantly evolving and, and, and being iterated. So the first step is um, to really consider that the problem goes beyond um, the medical problem. Um, usually, you know, we might think of a biology problem we're trying to tackle or a medical problem, but there's the reimbursement problem. There's the clinical trial problem, you know, for example, um, you know, what's the comparator going to be in the clinical trial? Um, and can we get that early in our experiments so that we can then determine whether our results are important or not? So often, you know, you might see scientific data presented where you have, you know, a graph and it looks like, you know, what's being presented is really great um, compared to some of the controls. But, you know, what we like to do is, is not just sort of put um, positive or negative controls to know whether something's working or to kind of get at the mechanism, but, but also controls that will tell us how um, close are we to the gold standard? Are we below, similar, or above um, you know, what's currently being used in the clinic? So these are some of the things. So I almost think of the problem as like a Venn diagram and, and you have like the biology problem, the medical problem, but then you have all these other things like patent problem, the manufacturing problem, the regulatory problem. And so I think in order to... to, to develop technologies that can then make it to patients, we need to think about the overlap between all of these different areas. The other thing that, that I found is really important is um, thinking about what's the success threshold, or in other words, you know, what's the best result others have achieved in a particular model, and then how much better do we need to do, and then making that the North Star of the project. So for example, let's say if we're working on like a, an oncology project, um, you know, we might think, okay, what is the animal model that others have used and what's the best survival they've seen for a certain time period? You know, maybe it's, you know, three out of 10 um, mice survived for, you know, six months. And so we might say, okay, well, do we need to get like double that? Do we need to double the timeline? Like we start to think about it and it's, there, there's no sort of clear answer, but we try to make it some sort of um, 
you know, best guess uh, of, of where we think we need to get to. Um, and then that becomes the goal of the, the project. Um, and then the experiments that we conduct, um, we're constantly trying to conduct experiments where we're trying to learn something new and gain critical insights. Um, and ideally, um, you know, ideally we want to run experiments where we're doing these comparisons to, uh, to the gold standards that are used in, in the clinic, if possible, it's not always, not always possible. The other is, 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 um, we try to conduct experiments where we try to learn something new or something that other people have overlooked that then provide a direct vertical for us to, um, to develop a new technology. So it's, I just find it so easy to come up with ideas of solutions, but often those solutions are not well-founded within a key insight, a key biological insight, for example. And so we look for these insights and then we then use the insights to figure out, okay, what's the solution gonna look like? Um, so I find that to be really important. And then um, we also try to think about our technology in terms of like, you know, what's the unfair advantage that we have? Like, what, what is it that we can do that, what, that our technology can do that nothing else can do? Because I find a lot of the times we get really excited about our technology, but then we realize that there's a dozen others that can do the exact same thing. Um, so we try then to use that as a guide to develop technologies that can do things that other technologies can't, uh, technologies that could be enabling to get a drug to a location that no other technology can do. So that's something that we're constantly thinking about and, and pushing for. Um, and then, and then um, the last is, is what I like to refer to as translational momentum, which is, you know, things always stall. We always run into problems. There's always challenges and failures. Um, and so you know, constantly thinking about how can we maintain momentum? How can we keep being persistent? And it's not always easy, but I find one way to do it is to think about infusing energy into the project. And I think um, one way that usually works is um, finding other people who have expertise, like potential collaborators that we don't have, and then bringing them in so they can kind of look at it through a novel lens that we haven't looked at it. And this can then generate a lot of excitement, enthusiasm, um, and, uh, and new energy. And this is, again, this is not like a, this is almost like a continuum. It's not necessarily in this order. We're just thinking of these things um, constantly. And, um, and then I think the other thing too, to consider is that, you know, just as, as we've been advancing that there's opportunities, you know, sometimes we come up with ideas. And so these are kind of like, you know, and then we look for people to collaborate with kind of more like outgoing opportunities. And sometimes people bring us ideas and, 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 and um, projects, and there's these incoming opportunities. And we're always trying to, um, you know, create as many opportunities as we can, and then apply them through these filters. Um, but also sort of recognizing sometimes you have opportunities in front of you, just a conversation, let's say that we just had, and that could lead to something really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we try to do is really, um, is just follow the energy. Um, and so, you know, there's a certain energy of collaborating with other people. Um, and I think kind of tuning into that energy transfer between people, um, is where it's really at. And that, you know, that's critical, I think, to just being persistent and, and really pushing through the challenging times. Um, and so, um, let me just tell you a quick story um, of uh, an example of, of something that happened um, where, you know, I like to think of this tool of, of being actively opportunistic. Um, so there was this grant, it was early in my faculty position in, in 2009, so I was just at it for a couple of years, um, and uh, I hadn't actually been successful at all in, in writing grants. Um, you know, I had like a year left of my startup package, um, and I wasn't able to secure much funding, um, and so I applied for this grant. It was, I think it was $40,000 to the Massachusetts uh, Tech Transfer Center. And, um, and they had me kind of go present my, um, my grant. And it was right after my daughter was born. Um, and like literally a few days after. So I was exhausted. And, you know, I stopped in the middle of my presentation. It just didn't seem to go well. But uh, at, towards the end, as I was kind of leaving the room, uh, somebody kind of pulled me aside and said, hey, let's go for coffee. One of the grant reviewers. 
And so I kind of thought about it and I was like, you know, I'm busy writing grants. I really need to bring in the funding. I need to be focused. But for some reason, there was this kind of like energy um, that I felt this gravity. And I thought, okay, you know, I should go, go meet this guy. His name was Val Lovato. So we went and met for coffee. And then he said, well, I think you should meet with my friend, Kathy Call at Santa Fe. And so again, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I've gone for coffee um, and, you know, had a great conversation, but now it's turning into another meeting. And is this just going to be meeting after meeting? But still, I felt that gravity. I was like, okay, I'll go meet with Kathy. So I met with, met with her and she said, okay, well, you know, you got to meet with Sridhar. Um, he's not in town right now. So let, wait till he comes back. And he's leading this kind of regenerative medicine effort. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm getting in deep here. I, I need to keep going. Um, so then I met with Sridhar and we totally hit it off. Um, he started inviting me to give presentations at Santa Fe in Boston, in San Diego, in Paris. Um, and start, I started to develop relationships with other people in the, in the company. And then he said, well, you know, why don't you propose a couple um, ideas to us? Maybe we could fund your lab. Um, and so I proposed two ideas, one they liked, one they didn't. Um, and that led to four years of, of pretty significant funding. Um, and then through the funding that I got through Santa Fe, I got to meet other people in the company. Um, and one um, person I met is down here in the bottom left, uh, Bernard Gilly, who ran, um, who runs an entrepreneurial ecosystem in, in Paris. And um, I had shown him some of the work we had done with tissue adhesives. Um, and he said, hey, how would you like to start a company on this? Um, and then he brought in Christophe Bancel, uh, Bancel who's a, um, an entrepreneur that he had worked with before. This is um, Stefan Bancel, who's the CEO of Moderna. This is his brother um, and uh, Christophe. And so we started um, a company together called Tissium, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And then um, one of the people who was leading this collaboration with my lab, um, Jacques Delors, um, when he said, okay, you know, I'm going to be leaving the company, let's work together. Um, and so we actually took a technology we had developed in, uh, in my lab, um, and we created a company called Skin to Feet, um, which is a skincare company. So this just an example of how like a single kind of, you know, cup of coffee with somebody led to, you know, funding in my lab, um, as well as, you know, cultivation of many um, really great relationships and, uh, and a com couple companies, um, which are, are still going strong. And then what I thought I'd also do is just maybe share with you um, one other um, story uh, from, from the lab, um, which, uh, which I um, spoke just, just briefly about. It's really the Tissium story. Um, and um, that, you know, kind of was a very kind of tortuous path as, as, as well. Um, and, uh, and so what happened was back in 2009, again, around the same time, um, Dr. Pedro Del Nido, who's the chief of cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, re reached out to me. Um, we had developed some some adhesives, and you know, he basically said that um, he was trying to treat um, children who have septal defects. So these are the um, holes in between the chambers of the heart. And he said, you know, he goes to suture it sometimes, and it just tears because it's so fragile. He said, um, you know, there's these devices that work in adults, but you can't downsize them because the children's hearts, you know, growing and, and the child would just outgrow the device. And it's not acceptable to um, have to come back and do multiple revision procedures. So we thought about it and, you know, quickly realized this is probably going to be one of the hardest projects we've ever done because um, for an adhesive to work in this environment, um, it's just, a, we're up against a lot of challenges. Um, one is, you know, there's, it's, it's very wet, clearly a lot of cells and enzymes. You have all kinds of things. Every surface is covered with blood. So how are we going to get something to attach to the heart? Um, we also, uh, you know, with the 60 beats per minute, you know, normal kind of contractions, it's this expansion contraction. So it, it could like something could delaminate. And then we have the flow of the blood and that force, um, and again, that could cause delamination. Um, so we kind of brainstormed and said, okay, you know, if we could do this um, and it was to work well, what might that look like? And we thought, okay, well, if we could develop some sort of a, a patch that had a thin layer of glue on it and we could put it um, into the heart and push it up around the surrounding tissue and it could attach and then cells could migrate on top of it to form new tissue. And then 
um, the material would degrade, the patient could be left with their own tissue sealing that hole, which could then naturally grow with the patient. So that's what we thought about. Um, and, uh, and we started to advance and we quickly hit all kinds of walls. Um, and, you know, seem like in pretty much every project, we, we get to the point where we're like, should we continue this? This is really is not going well. Um, and, um, and I think <clears throat> one of the challenges that, um, that we often face is that, um, we, we approach something and we have expectations of what's going to happen. Um, and then it doesn't happen. Um, and then we step back and we rethink it, or we think that we're rethinking it and we approach again and it, it still doesn't work because we're really just applying the exact same thinking. Um, and so I think one of the challenges for, for all of us is how do we create tools to, um, or use tools that can allow us to break free from this kind of conventional repetitive approach where how do we really bring in new ideas to kind of hijack the way that our brains typically operate and the processes that, that we've kind of be, have become um, our habits. And so one of the ways that we do this in my laboratory um, and, and there's many ways, I think, um, is to turn to nature for inspiration. So it's really this idea that every creature, every animal or plant that's alive today is here because it has solved an insurmountable number of problems. And those that haven't have quickly become extinct. So nature is truly the best problem solver. Um, you know, hundreds of millions of years of research and development happening all around us. And there's lots of papers actually in the literature describing mechanisms for how things work in nature. Um, and I just think it's so exciting. You know, we're, I think we're losing our connection to nature and this is such an exciting way to start to regain it, um, is to start to, you know, go into the academic literature or go for a walk in nature and just start to think about, okay, what solutions might exist here? Um, you know, what a great way to sort of um, leverage or harness our curiosity to bring in fresh ideas. And so we asked in this, this um, for this problem, which we were facing, we said, okay, well, what creatures exist within wet dynamic environments? And maybe what could we learn from them um, that we're not currently thinking about? So we looked at sandcastle worms that exist in the, um, in the sea. They sit on rocks and waves hit them and they remain put. And then slugs and snails. Sometimes you'll see, you know, a snail, on a leaf and it's raining and it's not moving, it's not falling off, it's not getting washed away. Uh, sometimes it's walking on the ground and there's this kind of goo behind it. And we started looking at, okay, well, what do these creatures have in common? Um, and we realized that they have a couple of things that are interesting. One is viscous secretions. So things that are viscous tend to stay put for a short amount of time. Like if you put honey on a table or the wall, um, it doesn't wash away right away. And we thought that might be interesting because if we develop a patch, and we have a thin layer of glue, well, maybe we'll put a precursor for that glue and it could be like a viscous material and that we put down, maybe we can get it to just stay long enough so the clinician can, can move it around to get it to the right site. Because we spoke to a bunch of doctors who said sometimes that's a problem, just, you know, if it's too adhesive and it just sticks, you want to be able to kind of move it around. Um, we had been developing a lot of light activatable materials in the lab. And so we thought maybe we'll use light um, to get on-demand adhesion. The other thing that was interesting that these creatures had in common was those secretions um, contain hydrophobic agents and things that are hydrophobic repel water. And so that immediate, immediately gave us an idea because we'd been thinking all along that we were going to perhaps be, you know, use something that's hydrophilic because to mimic the properties of tissues in the body, a lot of water content. But we thought, okay, well, what if we make this hydrophobic? It could repel the blood away from the surface of the heart. Um, and this would allow us to get intimate contact. So all this was, was you know, really interesting, but still didn't give us a sense of how are we gonna make this thing super adhesive? So um, what we did was, was kind of like what um, Ivy does. Uh, and that is, um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to pull Ivy from a surface, but it, it's incredibly difficult. It's really strongly attached. And the mechanism is that Ivy has these root hairs that go up and down the surface and they look for crevices and then they insert in, they secrete this kind of glue and then it dries and they shrivel up. And it, this is, you get this kind of mechanical interlocking um, of, the, of the glue and, the, and this kind of root hair. Um, and so we thought, okay, well, if, 
the glue could infiltrate into the tissue, light can go in maybe tens of microns, maybe 50 microns or so, maybe 100. Um, we might be able to then cure the glue in the tissue and get this almost like um, this almost like kind of mechanical Velcro like interaction. And so, um, and that's exactly what, what we found. I mean, after uh, I'm sort of sparing you all the trial and error that we did to get this to happen, it took several months, but eventually uh, on the top here, we, we basically just took the glue, A, the adhesive, put it onto the heart. Um, we then immediately uh, cured it with the light, freeze fractured it. And here you can see the collagen fibers and you can see the glue's gone in between the collagen fibers here um, and it's cured. So now it's like really strongly um, attached. So I'm gonna show you one of the most um, uh, challenging experiments we ever performed in the lab. Um, this is an animal experiment. Um, there is some, some blood here. I think this audience is probably used to seeing this, um, but if anyone isn't, just wanted to, to warn you in advance. Um, but what we wanted to do here was see if we could um, seal a hole um, in a rat heart, uh, actually a relatively large hole. So this is a dermal biopsy punch that we're using to create a hole. Um, and um, you know we have this purse string suture here, so the animals don't uh, bleed out during the procedure. We're gonna remove that in a moment. Um, and so we had to develop not only the glue, but also a patch. Um, and the patch needed to be biodegradable, transparent, um, and elastic. So here we are. We put the patch onto the heart. There's a glue on the underside. Um, the glue is light activatable. Um, and uh, in this particular animal, something went wrong, actually quite wrong, which was uh, one of the first animals we operated on. The patch was not big enough. It kind of slipped. So it, it attached, but it just didn't cover the full um, hole. Um, so what we did was we had to sort of act quickly. We removed the suture, we took the glue and we just put it on, just hoping for the best. And if you look carefully, you'll see that it's kind of less red where we have the glue. So it's repelling the blood away because it's hydrophobic. Because it's viscous, it stays in place long enough for another pulse of light. And we end up with a perfect seal. But we took these animals out six months and they all did fine. Um, so this was really a great um, advance for us in the lab, still a long way to go, um, but did give us a lot of you know, um, energy and, and momentum to, uh, to continue. <clears throat> So then what we did is we moved to a pig model um, and um, which was a, uh, you know, important for us to move to a large, large animal model um, and, uh, you know, to, to pressure test, to really pressure test this. And then also to ask, could this attach inside a beating heart exactly where you would have these septal defects? So Dr. Del Nido developed this cardioport device. We made an incision here on the myocardium, pushed this up against the septum, shined the light, removed it, sutured the myocardium. And here you can see um, two pigs, um, one on the left, here's the patch. And then the one on the right, here's the patch, um, 62 beats per minute. Um, so I'll play that just one more time because it's a little quick. So here's the patch here on the left and here's the one on the right, um, or was it 82 beats per minute? Um, and then what we did is after four hours, we added epinephrine to increase the heart rate to see, okay, would this still, um, to, you know, to really, really pressure test it more. Um, and um, heart rate went up, went up to 165, and you can see the patch here and the patch here. Um, no sutures, no staples. This was just the, the glue in the patch. Um, so after 24 hours, you know, still a relatively short time point, but a lot of kind of beats of the heart in that time. We took a look. Um, here you can see a suture. This is part of the deployment mechanism, um, but the patch was indeed um, attached. And just to um, pause here for a moment, the two people who led this project um, in the lab, um, Nora, a cardiac surgeon from Germany, and Maria, a material scientist um, in my laboratory, and Nora was in Dr. Del Nido's laboratory, and um, Nora and Maria forged this incredible um, collaboration, had this, you know, really great synergy, a surgeon and a material scientist. You know, initially, I think there was some friction in terms of trying to figure out how to work together, um, but eventually um, they just thrived through this um, kind of multidisciplinary interaction, um, you know, learning from each other. Um, and really, I think it's a big reason why we were able to advance this as far as we did. Um, we, I don't have time to show you all the details, but we did also 
develop uh, a way to deploy this via um, interventional approach. Um, so a device that goes into the heart, it's a double balloon structure. So you basically put the um, catheter through the septal defect and you have balloon on either side. Um, and then the patch comes out um, and, uh, and the balloons push the patch up against the heart. And then you shine the light and the light, the balloon has a, a reflective coating. So the light bounces backwards through the patch, activates the glue, and then we can pull the, um, the catheter through a tiny hole that we leave in the um, patch, which then can, uh, can self-seal. So we actually developed that um, just as a, a potential way that we might be able to deploy this via an interventional um, procedure. So we still continue to advance this work. Um, the glue itself proved to be um, you know, very interesting uh, because we could seal the carotid artery of a pig, the um, aorta of a pig, um, and uh, other tissues. So we started this company, Tissium, um, that I spoke briefly about a moment ago, uh, and they received regulatory approval in Europe for vascular reconstruction just for the, the glue, so sealing, sealing blood vessels. Um, now they're currently advancing um, to do sutureless nerve reconstruction, um, so the clinical trial just started, um, and tactless uh, hernia repair. And so when we started the company, we quickly realized we need to develop devices um, to deploy this in the body. So here you can see we're spraying it um, onto tissue here. I've added a blue dye so the surgeon can see where it's placed. Um, here is in a water tank with a vacuum uh, assisted device. So you can see it, um, it places, it uh, adheres really nicely um, underwater. And then we shine the light here on the left. You can see this is an LED light. And then here on the right, you can see um, that we can place this into very small environments via minimally invasive procedures um, into the body. Um, and here's the, um, the um, manufacturing operation, which is outside of Paris to do all the GMP manufacturing of the, the glue. And there were a lot of challenges uh, in getting that to work, um, didn't work initially. Um, so we actually had to change a bunch, bunch of things. Um, and then um, finally, I just wanted to tell you about another sort of offshoot of this story, which was I was talking about this work at the New England Aquarium at this really incredible conference called Zubiquity, where um, uh, animal doctors and human doctors get together and compare notes. And um, this is actually the penguin exhibit at the New England Aquarium. Some people may recognize it. Um, and here I am speaking and the penguins are actually kind of not behaving and they're super loud um, and um, a little difficult to see because a bit washed out. But um, I had to keep stopping in this um, talk because the penguins were just going nuts. Um, and I was afraid no one would hear what I was saying, but Dr. Bill Rosenblatt did. And he was, um, he's a, 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 a doctor at Angel Memorial. Um, so he is a veterinarian. Um, and he was in charge of the, at the time, the um, oral and craniofacial medicine um, at this uh, uh, vet hospital. And he said, you know, let's keep in touch. This might be useful uh, for what we're doing someday. So he reached out to me a few months later and he said he has a patient, which is a bulldog. Uh, he had pulled a tooth and it left a hole from the oral to the nasal cavity um, and it wasn't sealing. Um, and he had done, um, uh, I think, three tissue flaps where he cut tissue, pulled it over, sutured it, and it failed three separate times um, because there's so many forces in the bulldog's mouth. So he, Dr. Rosenblatt said, okay, well, why, why don't we debris that hole, we'll put your glue in um, and we'll cure it multiple layers. So we'll kind of really build it up and then we'll pull a tissue flap over top uh, and suture it. And then maybe the material will provide some structural support. So instead of it all being on the tissue flap, it could be absorbed by the, um, by the biomaterial, um, this cured glue, and then the glue will dissolve away and, and the, um, eventually the tissue will just um, replace it. So here's what um, the hole looked like. Um, this was a 10 year old bulldog, was really in miserable condition, wasn't eating very well. You can see kind of part of the uh, tissue flap that was still here, but mostly had kind of torn. Um, and so what we did is we went in, um, we uh, put the glue multiple layers, um, hard to see, but it's here, it's a little shiny. Um, and then uh, redid the tissue flap, pulled that over um, and sutured it. So the dog went away, came back a few weeks later. Um, the previous tissue flaps had only lasted two or three days. 
And Dr. Rosenblatt kind of was wrestling with the dog to get its mouth open, something some of you may be familiar with. I'm cer certainly am. Um, and eventually he looked and, you know, it was a very kind of emotional moment because, you know, he had known the, um, you know, he had been treating this dog for, for years and years um, and had three failed procedures and it appeared um, here to, to have worked um, and actually ended up working for, for a couple of years um, um, which we're all really excited about. And so the data that we were able to generate from this experiment, I want to show you in a before and after picture. So here is uh, the bulldog before the procedure. And you can see he's extremely unhappy. And then here he is after the procedure. Extremely happy. So we've gone from here, unhappy, to happy. Um, and um, the owner was really, you know, excited about this. Um, and uh, yeah, no, we, this actually, just to sort of um, state one more thing here, um, this really created a lot of energy in the lab because we'd never really thought that our work would apply to animals. Um, we certainly use some animals in our, our experiments. And I think this to us is kind of maybe just a tiny, um, you know, something to kind of give back. And so I went, I did grand rounds at Angel Memorial, this animal um, hospital. And, um, and that's actually led to another collaboration. Currently, we're, we're doing a, uh, one of the um, technologies that we've been working on with a collaborator. Um, we're looking at um, uh, testing that in a cancer model um, in dogs. Um, and so that's currently, currently ongoing. Um, but just sort of I think to me, it was just fascinating how all of these technologies that we're developing, we think only, you know, about human trials, that there may actually be this huge opportunity, um, especially where for, for animals, especially where the kind of current state of the art is, is, is just not, not good enough. And there may be opportunities to take even some experimental approaches um, to try them because, you know, sometimes they might, may just work. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to share with you, you know, I talked a lot about um, some of the technologies that we developed and kind of showed a lot of the good results. Um, and, uh, you know, there certainly has been our, you know, we've had our fair share of failures and challenges and sort of moments where many moments where we just feel like, um, you know, kind of thrown in the towel and, and um, this is just not working. And um, actually one of those moments uh, came to me, when I was asked to speak um, at a TEDMED conference, um, and uh, you know, I had memorized um, some speeches, like two or three minute speeches when I was younger, um, but you know, most of these are like fifteen or twenty minutes, um, and uh, I was kind of frightened about that, but I decided to go ahead because I just saw it as a challenge. Uh, Memorization has always been very challenging for me. Um, and so, you know, spent a lot of time putting this talk together, practicing it over and over again. This was months of work doing, basically working on it every day. Um, and then I showed up, um, and they said, well, you know, here's the controller to advance the slides. You can't advance it backwards. If you need to go backwards, you need to yell out, please reverse the slide. So I thought, okay, for sure. I'm never going to say that I better not advance too rapidly. And they said, you know, sometimes what happens is people um, freeze when they're on the stage and they said, well, you know, if that happens to you, don't run off the stage because sometimes people do that. Um, they said, um, just smile. Um, so here's what happened to me. Let's see if I can play this here. So that we could study them and determine which drug killed the residual tumor. Surround yourself by many examples in nature. So, so I stopped in the middle of my talk. I was basically, I'd memorized the talk like so well. And as I was speaking, I was thinking about different things and I then lost track of where I was. Um, and I tried to do what they said. I tried to smile. I was like saying every swear word I knew in my mind. 
um, trying to figure out how I would get back. I then advanced the slide. It was a blank slide. I was like, oh my God, why is there a blank slide there? I advanced it again, realized the blank slide was a cue to me myself, but then I realized I knew with the lines to continue. Um, and as I was headed off stage, they said to me, and this was very traumatic when it happened. I was like, you know, I, I um, they said to me, um, oh, we can just edit that out. And so online, if you look at this TED Med talk I did, you won't see what I just showed you because they actually have edited out this long, I don't know if it's like 15, 20 second pause or something like that. But I will say one more thing here, which is that experience actually has helped me um, improve my presentations because I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable. The fact that I was had stopped in front, there was five high definition cameras on me. Um, it was really, um, you know, at the, it was at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Um, and the fact that I was able to recover, that kind of actually gave me, um, just gave me comfort kind of moving forward in my talks. And so I want to end with um, this quote, um, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time um, by Michael Jordan, who says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeed. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's the failure is, is it's the challenges. It's just so painful in the moment. Um, but I've kind of realized over time and it never goes away. It's always painful. Um, but I think, you know, as I was saying before, you know, when we do fail, I look at it as an opportunity to be creative, to try to come up with, you know, to try to learn something new, seek out some new insight, bring in somebody new to, to just re-energize the project. Um, and almost every time it allows us to kind of figure out a new vertical to at least try to try. Um, and, and sometimes that, that, that has, um, you know, worked out really well. Um, so at this time, I just want to thank everyone uh, for your attention. I'm not sure if I can take questions here, but I'd be uh, happy to do so. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Karp, for your genuinely real and really inspiring presentation. Um, it's very wonderful to hear about medical in innovation. We will now be transitioning over to the Q&A portion. So I'm going to be going, uh, passing the mic over to you, to our moderator, Samia. Have you here with us? So we have received a lot of questions and we will do our best to get through all of them in the time that we have with you. So for the first question, I'm going to be passing the mic to Gayatri. So Gayatri, if you could ask the question, that would be great. Uh, hello, Dr. Karp. Thank you so much for that very informative session. Uh, we, I think we can all agree that we really learned a lot. Uh, so my question is, how do you actually identify when a scientific discovery, a scientific breakthrough is actually ready for commercialization? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's a tough question to answer because they're never, there's, it's like, I feel, and I'm, I, I'm right there with you. Like, I would love for there to be like a linear Pro, you know, there'd be to like, okay, here's the recipe, you know, or here's, here's the moment. Um, in my experience, it's never that way. It's never. And it, it's, I find that it, a lot of it is through having conversations with people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So sort of, you know, it, it conversations with investors, with people who have expertise in the space that you're working in, who have maybe commercialized things before and sort of loading to them, you know, ideally, these are people that you trust in your network. And, you know, you're, or you could do like confidentiality agreements with them, but sort of asking them, like, you know, what do you think? Like, what do you think's missing? What, what are the holes? Um, what experiments would you do next? Um, or what could we do to strengthen this? Um, sort of like just asking those types of questions and getting there and then asking them that question, like what, what would it take for you to invest in this? What would you need to see? Um, 
and sort of listening to the answers. And so sometimes, and then doing that with multiple people and sort of looking for the overlap, looking for the things that just really jump out as being like, yes, that, that, and then I think, you know, then we go back to the lab. So there's, there's, it's often this sort of iterative process of starting to ask those questions and then using the answers we get to then drive the next experiments we perform. Sometimes we need to apply for funding to do those experiments. Um, and then that iterative process until we've addressed some of the things that we then feel are critical. And then, you know, that sort of takes us on that journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Kappa. I can really understand that uh, business and entrepreneurship really plays a huge role in this discipline. So thank you so much for that answer. Uh, back to you, Soumya. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kappa. Uh, so this question uh, will be asked by me. So my question is, how do you foresee artificial intelligence progressing towards medical innovation in the future, like say by 2050, for example? Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't done a lot of AI. Um, I think, you know, we, we all use it, I think, to um, kind of every day with like, you know, Google or, you know, all the different sort of um, technologies that, that, that we use in our kind of daily activities. Um, but I think that in, um, in medicine, I think this is going to allow us, like just as like one example, um, so like being able to um, detect melanoma, for example, or skin cancer. Um, I had, uh, you know, several months ago, uh, or maybe it was now like a year ago, um, I had this like little mark that appeared on my face and, and, um, you know, I was like, should I go in? Should I not go in? And there's this like activation energy to go in. Um, and so I kind of was like, I don't know, I don't know. And then eventually I went in and sure enough, it was, um, basal cell carcinoma and I had to get like treatment for it. So I think, you know, there could potentially be these technologies where we'll have much faster, you know, at home, um, I don't, you know, maybe even diagnosis um, or some indication that, um, that, you know, we need to, to go in. I think we'll have much early, I think AI can be very helpful for much earlier detection um, of things. I think it may also be able to sort of like, by learning about the variability across the population in terms of the biology, I think it's going to improve a lot of like the personalized type approaches. Um, and then also offer, um, uh, you know, methodologies or, or prophylactic kind of treatment. So things that we can do to prevent, um, you know, with, you know, now we have like um, all sorts of ways of kind of looking at our genetics to see what we're predisposed to. Um, but, you know, there's not a ton that we can, I mean, there's certain things we can do to prevent, but, but not a lot. I think we'll have a lot better idea as we dig further into AI about how we might be able to prevent the progression of certain types of maybe chronic diseases or, you know, things that we're predisposed to. Um, and then I think there's also going to be uh, kind of a merger as well with, you know, wearables um, and sort of, um, you know, wellness and being able to um, maintain our, our bodies um, in a healthy state, you know, much longer, which should improve, um, you know, not just our, our, our lifespan, but also, you know, the wellness um, during that, during that time. And I think, you know, with robotics and robotic, you know, there's, there's um, pills now that are being developed that are, have robots that can then essentially like inject drugs into the um, body at particular um, uh, um, uh, doses at particular times can actually stay there in the body. I mean, I think all of these things can then be integrated into, um, you know, uh, platforms that are involve clinical decision making. So based on, you know, data that's coming out, you know, the drug that's being delivered will just increase or decrease dependent on, you know, what the data is, is showing. So, I think, I think just things are going to be faster. They're going to be more predictive. We're going to have more accuracy. We'll have much better preventative approaches. I think it's really going to transform things. 
and really thank you so much for that answer it was something i've been really curious about because like we you know about chat gpt and how like it has even passed various medical exams uh, recently and also i read an article recently where like a paper test could offer early cancer diagnosis like based on like the proteases and which type of peptide they're cleaving so i feel like ai has a very positive future so thank you so much for that quest answer dr kar So now, Gabriel, can you please ask your question? So thank you, Dr. Karp, about your amazing lecture. I love research technology and how we can help people through it. It it was really inspiring. And so my question, it is also about artificial intelligence. It's a new and trending topic. So. <laughs> In your opinion, what's the biggest concern about these increasing technologies, especially art- artificial intelligence and medicine? What do you think uh, can go wrong with it? Wow. Um, yeah, great question. Um, well, um, I think maybe, you know, one thing is that artificial intelligence requires having data and so i think that um and 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 i think and you know an element of kind of where we're headed is that, that you know we need the our personalized data to then be mined and sort of overlaid on what the kind of current databases um you know the data in those those databases i guess what i'm saying is that you know at some point there you know the, we're we're going to be sharing a lot of data and i think that So I think there's the potential for that data to be, um, you know, intercepted um, by various groups, um, and I think that you know there may also be, um, depending on how medicine kind of progresses over time. But you know, if we're if we're more, um, you know, kind of like staying in our homes and not having to go to our doctor to get diagnoses and to get, you know, our medicines and things like that. I think there, you know, may also be, you know, every sort of step in that process could potentially be, be intercepted. Um, I think, um, you know, there could be, um, you know, viruses like computer viruses, you know, that could do crazy things with um, our, our data, maybe even like perhaps even mix things up. And, and so we end up getting the wrong treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, this kind of seems like a, a, a science fiction, like a, you know, movie that like a horror movie, you know, type movie, when you start to think about all the possibilities of where things can go wrong. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, motivations, you know, for, for just, let's say like power and greed. And, and I think, um, you know, when people's kind of ego, when people lead with ego, you know, often that takes us into a, a kind of negative, um, place. And so those who have access to the data, um, or who, um, somehow maybe are building the, the platforms, the algorithms, who are in charge of administering these things, you know, some people could potentially go rogue or have the wrong intentions um, and may lead this, you know, potentially astray. I mean, I think this kind of happens with any new technology that there's always sort of like the yin and yang, you know, that, um, and that's why it's so important to kind of, you know, slow roll these technologies into society and have lots and lots of conversations and, and sort of educating people in terms of what's coming and, and um, so that we can create the right policies, you know, through governments, um, so that these are, you know, heavily regulated. And as we learn, we can be very nimble and dynamic to kind of adjust those regulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Karp. And that's a lot to discover and to to know, to manage. And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So unfortunately, this will be our last question for today. So most of the time, can you please go ahead and ask your question? 
Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Karp, for that wonderful presentation. It was truly a delight to listen to you and uh, listen to your such an listen to you on this Monday night. So, my question to you is for your more junior attendees who are just getting into research and medicine, what inspired you to pursue the field of research and how has this choice impacted your life? Has it been everything that you had initially anticipated? Thank you so much. And I would love to hear your answer on this. Hey, thank you for that question. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's interesting I in, in the sense that, um, you know, I mean, I almost feel like almost anything that you, any sort of decision you make, you kind of only are peering a little bit around the corner. You don't quite have like a full grasp of, of kind of everything you're going to encounter and the decisions you're going to make and the challenges and, you know, all these kinds of things, I think. Um, but you, you, you often have enough of a sense of, you know, a connection with your curiosity um, and, I think that to me, that is really what I've tried to let lead a lot of my decisions. Um, and so I think early on, you know, as I was kind of starting to be exposed to the research world and I just saw the potential for um, coming up with ideas, like, you know, I would sort of observe um, professors and, and how they can, you know, kind of be like, well, how do they come up with ideas of what to do? And, and I quickly realized that, you know, it could just be like in the shower or on a walk to the lab or, you know, in, in a coffee shop, or, you know, these ideas are just kind of happening in all these different places. And then it's, you know, kind of connected to these observations, um, of things that aren't working well, and that there's this opportunity to then, work on something important that if it works could really, you know, add value to society and, and hopefully make the world a better place. Um, you know, what I didn't quite see is the challenges of, you know, writing um, grants and not getting a lot of them funded or, you know, the challenges of getting papers rejected or, you know, experiments not going well, all these things. Um, and so it kind of took me a while to get, um, I wouldn't say like so much like used to that, but to really look at that as part of the process to really appreciate that that wasn't something that was supposed to be like avoided, but rather was what I should be seeking. So it's like, I should just give you an example. Like when I started writing grants and they got rejected, you know, it was really felt like a punch in the face every time. But then um, what happened was I would get feedback for a lot of the grants and I'd be like, well, hold, hold on a moment here. They're actually giving me somewhat of a recipe on how to win the next grant. Um, and so it was kind of, I was then all of a sudden in this process, learning this process of how to write grants. Um, and so to me, you know, there's just so many elements of being a faculty member and, and, you know, having a research lab and being able to kind of, um, you know, come up with ideas, but then also this kind of really incredible environment of, of being able to interact with people um, like students and postdocs and collaborators. And it's just so dynamic because everybody has different ideas, different frames of reference, different, you know, they're from different countries, different education systems, different ways they think, um, you know, different expertise, this multidisciplinary environment is just really, really invigorating to be in that, you know, so it's almost like, you know, you may get down one day, but then all of a sudden you just learn something new or your curiosity, you know, just connects with something different and, and you're off again. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think it, 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 to me, it's just been really, really, um, fulfilling. It's like, you know, every project we advance on, it's, it's almost like, you know, I don't know, like Indiana Jones or La Laura Croft or, you know, whoever you want, you know, it's just like this adventure where we don't really know whether it's going to work, but, we know that we can uh, apply the processes we've learned to learn new things, to gain insights and to make progress towards something that is, you know, kind of, it's like having this collective sense of importance. It's just really, really exciting to be part of a team where everybody feels that and we're all trying to do whatever we can and bring what we can to the table and constantly thinking about it from different perspectives. So I think, it definitely has been, you know, as fulfilling, if not way more than I initially thought. And I say, just to close, 
um, the thing that I think I just kind of keep coming back to is like those challenges and the failures and it's just how each one of those has just been transformative, you know, not in that moment, <laughs> you know, in the moments they're not great, but, you know, each one of them has kind of contributed to the ability to then refine a process that has increased chance of working um, kind of like the next time. And I, I just find that really exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Karp. And with that, we come to an end to the Q&A session. Your passion is truly amazing. And we'd like to give a huge thank you for such an amazing session. Thank you for all the great questions. And thank you to all of our attendees. Please continue to follow Venues Week on all of our platforms. And be sure to catch the replay. Do join us for the next, next session with Dr. Matthew Matal.